Before we formally open this event, we would like to put down some reminders. This presentation is being recorded. During the duration of this webinar, kindly turn off your camera and keep your microphones on mute. For questions and clarifications, please type your concerns in the chat box. Our moderator will go through the questions during the open forum. Also, please remember to fill out the evaluation forms before leaving the webinar. A link will be provided in the chat box later. For this breakout session, let us talk about metabolic associated fatty liver disease and how to approach it. This session will be presented by Dr. Stephen N. Wong. He finished his training in hepatology at the University of Michigan and Changgong Memorial Hospital in Taiwan. He was the past president of the Hepatology Society of the Philippines and is the Fellowship Training Officer of the University of Santo Tomas Hospital Gastroenterology Fellowship Program. This session will be moderated by Dr. Anne Margaret C. Navarosa, a graduate of the Gastroenterology Fellowship Training Program of the University of Santo Tomas Hospital and is currently an ERCP Fellow at the University of Santo Tomas Hospital. Good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, and the scientific community for inviting me to give you this afternoon's lecture. And uh, I would like to con congratulate the whole organizing committee uh, for coming up with the first postgraduate uh, of this new year. Uh, so for this afternoon, uh, I'll be talking on the approach to metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease or MAFO. Now, for those of you who uh, maybe heard this term the first time, you might be asking yourself, wait, is this a new thing? Is this a new uh, disease? Um, so uh, this afternoon, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll let you know that this is actually um, sort of a, a new terminology for an old disease. Um, so the old NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease has been uh, change to MAFO or metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease. Now, of course, this new uh, change in the terminology has not been accepted by everyone yet. Uh, particularly, the US group uh, has not really uh, embraced this term yet. But I suspect that moving forward, uh, most of the societies uh, will be using this term uh, to denote fatty liver disease. In fact, our very own uh, Asia-Pacific guidelines have already adopted uh, the term MAFON as a definition for fatty liver disease. Now, how do radiologists usually diagnose MAFON or NAFON? Um, usually on ultrasound, what they do is they compare the color of the kidney with the color of the liver. And uh, usually the liver and the kidney are the same in color, the same in echogenicity. As you can see here, uh, this liver here is slightly more echogenic compared to your kidney. So the radi radiologist will say uh, that this patient has mild fatty liver. Now, if you compare it with the right, uh, right picture, you can see that the liver is markedly echogenic compared to your kidney. And these patients will be termed as severe fatty liver by most radiologists. Um, other things that they look for is the diaphragm uh, because the fat in the liver impedes the, the, the progress of your ultrasound waves. Um, it will make your diaphragm less clear if you have a more severe fatty liver. So you can see here, this is mild fatty liver. On the right-hand portion, this is severe fatty liver. Now, however, this uh, grading system uh, is not well accepted, not well regulated, and, and therefore, uh, you know, it's, it's not really very reliable. Um, so, for example, when you get a patient with mild fatty liver now on ultrasound and you get the patient back uh, after one year with moderate fatty liver, it may not really mean that the steatosis has progressed. It may mean that 
maybe the ultrasound machine that was used uh, was different. Uh, so it's uh, machine dependent. And maybe the operator was also uh, different. So it's all also operator de dependent. Now there are of course um, more accurate ways of measuring the amount of fat in the liver. Uh, and I would, uh, I would just um, tell you some of the uh, ways that we can measure it later on. Now, in terms of diagnosis, so this is the old criteria of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. If you think about it, NAFL uh, is really a diagnosis of exclusion. Look at this definition. Um, for NAFL, you have to have fatty liver, either on imaging, biopsy, or serum biomarkers. Usually for serum biomarkers, um, the, the most commonly used will be the fatty, fatty liver index or FLI, which uh, you just need the GGT or triglycerides, uh, and then they will compute it, uh, and you will know if the patient has steatosis or not. So once you have fatty liver, uh, then you have to exclude things. So meaning uh, you have to exclude hep B, hepatitis C, other causes of chronic liver disease, um, and especially alcohol as well. Now, the problem is uh, we realize nowadays that some patients with fatty liver, in fact, most patients with fatty liver um, may have concomitant, um, you know, other causes of chronic liver injury. So for example, you can have a patient with uh, hepatitis B, for example, who's also obese, who's also um, diabetic, and, um, and these patients are more likely or not to have fatty liver as well on imaging, okay? Uh, also, patients with al al severe alcohol intake, they can actually have fatty liver uh, disease also from metabolic causes. So that is why uh, the um, a consortium of international experts uh, came up with the term of MAFLD or metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease. So basically for this uh, diagnosis, you have to have fatty liver number one, but you also have to meet certain criteria. So I've um, highlighted in yellow, uh, you have to have at least one. Either you have diabetes uh, or you are overweight or you have evidence of metabolic dysregulation. If you, uh, for the endocrinologists out there, uh, you can very well recognize these criteria uh, because these criteria are used for uh, the diagnosis of the metabolic syndrome, okay? So uh, once you have at least one of these things, then you can clinch the diagnosis of MAFON, okay? Now, of course, uh, the, di the, the term of uh, MAFON was devised prior to the uh, appearance of clinical data. Um, so for most things uh, in, in our era, which is evidence-based, um, we need evidence in order to, uh, you know, prove something, okay? So the critics of this new MAFL criteria have said that, oh, we cannot use this. Uh, why? Because we don't have clinical data. Number two, what is the implication on epidemiology? It will, it will uh, you know, bring all the epidemiology data that we have for fatty liver di disease out of whack. Um, what else? What is the implication on prognostication? Um, so all of these things actually can be answered by data moving forward. Okay, uh, so some of these questions have already been uh, starting to get answers uh, from um, new studies that have come out uh, after the, the, the term was uh, coined um, um, late 2020. Um, other critics says that, you know, you cannot use metabolic because, uh, for example, alcohol, uh, Wilson's disease, um, they also causes metabolic derangements that's why you develop fatty liver disease. Uh, so those are the minor, I, I would say, minor arguments against MAFL. Um, another argument is that uh, they're saying that, you know, a lot of, they've worked so hard uh, for other people to recognize that fatty liver disease is a disease worth noting 
uh, for. Uh, it's a disease that's worth uh, following up for uh, because you can have significant morbidity and mortality afterwards. Um, so they're saying, if you change the, the, the terminology now, you know, people may be confused and they will say, okay, forget about it. I cannot even, uh, uh, you know, memorize the, the definition of map one, okay? Um, and finally, they were saying uh, most of the drugs that are being tried out there uh, use NAFO, you know, uh, criteria uh, for getting, for giving the drugs. And uh, if you change it to MAFO now, uh, what if those drugs turn out to be, uh, you know, uh, a positive uh, drugs for MAFO? Then you, FDA cannot approve it for MAFO because the term has changed. So minor uh, gripes, I would say, uh, against the, the diagnosis. Um, so in essence, because NAFOLD and MAFOLD have different diagnostic criteria, you will have this pie chart. Uh, you will have, I would say, maybe majority of patients who will meet both the diagnostic, diagnostic criteria of NAFOLD and MAFOLD. But you can also have some patients who, who will uh, meet the diagnosis uh, diagnostic criteria of MAFOL and not MAFOL. And I would say maybe uh, most of these patients will be uh, patients with uh, concomitant um, uh, chronic liver diseases such as Hep B or alcohol. Now, you can also have theoretically uh, patients who meet the diagnosis of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease but not meet MAFOL criteria, okay? So fortunately, uh, you know, the scientific committee, uh, uh, community, uh, I think, you know, is are very uh, vigilant uh, in terms of trying to prove something. So when the MAFO uh, criteria came out, um, a lot of uh, studies have been made uh, to look at epidemiology. Uh, what is the impact of this new terminology on, on epidemiology? So as you can see here, uh, a lot of data uh, the largest one is from Korea, uh, 9.5 million people from the national database. Um, the next one will be from the U.S. Uh, but you can see here uh, the changing the, the diagnosis, the, the diagnostic criteria from MAFO, um, uh, from NAFO to MAFO. The prevalence have not changed uh, by much, okay? Uh, very little differences in terms of prevalence. Um, and you can see here that uh, majority of patients actually meet both NAFOL and NAFOL criteria. Uh, a minority, uh, you know, there's, there's a big variation actually, uh, but um, in general, a minor uh, population uh, do not meet MAFOL criteria, but will meet your NAFOL criteria. Um, and the implication of these, uh, you know, meaning if you, uh, use MAFOL as a diagnostic criteria of fatty liver disease. Potentially, you may miss this much uh, patients uh, who are not diagnosed to have fatty liver disease because you have ch changed the terminology. But what are the implications? Uh, basically, uh, this study, uh, this is from Sri Lanka, uh, a relatively, la relatively large study also. Um, what they're saying is that if you use MAFOL criteria, it's better um, in terms of predicting the, the, the presence of fibrosis in patients compared to the NAFOL criteria. So using the NAF, uh, NAFOL fibrosis score, the FIB4 score, and BARD score, which are, which are all non-invasive um, ways of measuring fibrosis, you can see that MAFOL is better in terms of predicting fibrosis. Okay, but I'd like to point out to you uh, that patients who do not meet NAFOL criteria but meets NAFOL criteria show, shown in green, um, a minority of these patients actually can ha already have fibrosis, even if they have not met NAFOL criteria, criteria yet. Um, and this will have implications later on uh, in terms of uh, you know, if you, if you have a patient who has fatty liver and does not meet your MAFOL criteria, will you forget about them 
or will you follow them up? And I'll show you more data later on uh, what to do uh, in case you have those patients. So um, what else? This study looked at cardiovascular events um, and the predicting predictor um, prediction of cardiovascular events if you use MAFL criteria versus NAFL criteria. So as you can see here, if you use MAFL criteria, then you have a greater chance of predicting incident uh, cardiovascular events compared to NAFL, okay? Um, but I'd also like to point out to you that even if you only meet NAFL criteria, there's still a small risk of um, developing incident cardiovascular events over the control group, okay? Next, which brings us really uh, to the age old question um, is that, um, you know, does NAFLD or does fatty liver uh, give rise to metabolic derangements or is it the other way around? Does, metabolic, does the presence of metabolic derangements give rise to the presence of fatty liver? Um, I think this question has been answered uh, thoroughly already. Uh, by multiple studies. And I show you some, uh, you know, relevant studies um, in order to prove my point. So in terms of uh, the development of uh, natural or fatty liver, uh, if you have diabetes or no diabetes, you can see here that uh, diabetes, the presence of diabetes um, predicts uh, the, the, the increased incidence of fatty liver later on. So sometimes uh, patients can have metabolic derangements first, and then they will develop fatty liver later on. What about the other way around? So in this study, you can see that it can actually be the other way around. You can have a patient with fatty liver without metabolic derangements, and then later on, they can develop uh, diabetes. So in this case, um, the more severe the fatty liver that you see on ultrasound, the greater the chance that the patient will develop diabetes, uh, in this case, in this study, over five years, over control groups, okay? So both, um, it can happen uh, both ways. If you have diabetes, it increases your incidence of developing fatty liver. If you have fatty liver, then it also increases your uh, incidence of developing diabetes later on. Uh, finally, uh, for for this um, you know for this question, uh, you can see here that if you have fatty liver but not meeting MAFL criteria, if you follow these patients up, what is the probability that these patients will actually develop uh, components of the uh, of the MAFL criteria? And you can see here that over controls, uh, the incidence is about twenty percent over seven years. So meaning uh, even for, uh, you know, other metabolic derangements such as hypertension, um, high triglycerides, low HDL, and uh, the, you know, the presence of central obesity, these, these uh, characteristics can develop over time uh, in patients with just fatty liver without meeting the initial criteria for MAFL. So finally, if you imagine it, um, I would think that um, because NAFL patients without, who do, do not meet NAFL criteria later on have been shown to develop um, you know, characteristics of metabolic dysregulation later on, I would suspect that over time, these patients will actually already meet both NAFL and NAFL criteria as well. Okay, so what is the implication really in following these patients up? I think the implication really is if you, I mean, um, I guess right now it's, um, it's safe to say that we should be using MAFL criteria uh, in diagnosing patients with fatty liver, but if they do not meet MAFL criteria, but there's fatty liver on ultrasound, you still have to follow these patients up uh, because these patients will later on more likely meet your MAFL criteria as well. So what is a clinical course 
of patients with NAFLD or MAFLD. So succeedingly, uh, I would just jump around with NAFLD and MAFLD because most of the studies, older studies, use NAFLD as the definition, okay? So uh, if you imagine it, fatty liver is really a spectrum. You don't just stop with, let's say, steatohepatitis and stop there. Uh, so it's a spectrum of disease. So you can have a patient with just simple steatosis, which is just fat in the liver, or development of uh, inflammation or steatohepatitis. Now, of course, we know that in the liver, once you have inflammation, it will uh, it can induce um, fibrosis or scar tissue formation. Uh, and of course, if your um, inflammation is chronic, uh, then the scar tissue will just be deposited on top of each other. And then later on, you will now develop cirrhosis, okay? And since it's a sort of a, like a vicious cycle, uh, then cirrhosis, uh, you still have inflammation, you will now beget um, more fibrosis, and then you get more, um, you know, and so on and so forth. You get more uh, fibrosis and eventually uh, cirrhosis. And of course, uh, patients with NAFLD or MAFLD can also develop HCC. Now, you might ask yourself, uh, what is the probability of progression? So for simple steatosis to progress to steatohepatitis, the progression rate is about, the prevalence is about 40 to 60%. So majority of patients actually will progress to steatohepatitis later on. Now, of course, it has been shown that Patients who um, do not uh, solve the metabolic derangements that they have do not lose weight um, because it's a risk factor for, uh, for fatty liver. Those are the patients who are more likely to progress as well. Now, in terms of um, prognosis, fibrosis is still the most important predictor of survival. And you can see here that um, in terms of progression, both simple steatosis and steatohepatitis or NASH can both progress to fibrosis. Now, what is the difference? Uh, even though most of, both of them can progress by about 40% over time, um, the speed of progression is markedly different. You can see here that for steatohepatitis, uh, um, the fibrosis course will progress by one stage every seven years. Now for simple steatosis, it's 14 years. So the, the main difference is really speed. So for steatohepatitis, there's a higher likelihood there's a, uh, uh, that the patient will progress to fibrosis faster compared to simple steatosis. Now, of course, there's also a minority group uh, that are what we term as rapid progressors, meaning in the span of six years, these patients may actually develop uh, significant fibrosis, meaning stage three or stage four fibrosis, form a fibrosis score of zero or one initially. Who are these patients? These patients are uh, the patients who are uh, more likely to have multiple um, metabolic risk factors, meaning if they, have, if they are, for example, overweight with diabetes, with cardiovascular disease, with hypertriglyceridemia, uh, uh, all of these metabolic dysregulations, the more risk factors that you have, the more likely, the, the higher the likelihood that you will be a rapid progressor. Okay, so of course you don't want that and you want to address these metabolic dysfunction uh, in patients with fatty liver disease. Now, finally, for uh, you know, the spectrum of the disease, HCC or hepatocellular carcinoma is a, is a is um, you know, an endpoint that we don't want to happen in our patients. Now, it used to be that we thought uh, that it's only hepatitis B that can induce hepatocellular carcinoma without uh, cirrhosis. But now we know that even for NASH or, or, or fatty liver disease, these patients can actually develop uh, HCC without going through cirrhosis. And the main reason really is uh, in the presence of inflammation, there's continuous liver regeneration. And when that happens in the presence of an inflammatory background, uh, the ability of our body
to uh, catch uh, cells that have uh, DNA uh, problems, DNA uh, changes or mutations are diminished. So uh, cells that are dysplastic are allowed, uh, are allowed to grow, are allowed to multiply um, in the presence of uh, in inflammatory changes. And that can sometimes induce HCC in these patients. Okay, so if you, now you have a patient with MAFL, you've diagnosed them uh, through ultrasound and you uh, look at all the metabolic risk factors and this patient uh, meets your criteria for MAFL, what do you do now? The most important thing that you have to do is really to assess for fibrosis. Of course, uh, in medicine, uh, back in medical, med medical school, we're taught that you have to have a good clinical eye. What do you mean? What do I mean by that? Of course, you have to look for stigmata of cirrhosis. Look for palmar erythema, uh, spider angioma. Uh, you know, are there signs of portal hypertension as well? Uh, so those are the things that you have to look for clinically. What else? There are other lab tests that, are, uh, that will make you suspect for the presence of uh, cirrhosis. If your albumin is low, it reflects poor sy synthetic function by your liver. If your prothrombin time is abnormal as well. If your bilirubins are abnormal, then it reflects poor excretory function of your liver. If your platelet count is, is low, that also reflects poor synthetic function because thrombopoietin is produced by your liver, okay? So all of these things are clues uh, right there in your simple labs that will tell you if the patient has cirrhosis or not. Fortunately, there are also non-invasive ways of assessing fibrosis that you don't need liver biopsy in most patients with fatty liver nowadays. So the two most, uh, I would say the two easiest uh, scores that you can do right there in your clinic are the FIB4 score and the NAFL fibrosis score. Why is it easy? As you can see here, for the FIB4 score, you just need age, ALT, AST, and platelet count. So very easy. What about NAFL fibrosis score? You just add BMI, your albumin, and your sugar levels. So not very difficult because most of these labs, most of this, these clinical assess assessments, you can already get them uh, from your regular general checkup uh, labs, right? Uh, and fortunately, you know, our smartphones nowadays are even smarter than us. You can just download an app that will compute these scores for you. You know, um, I use MedCalc, but there are other uh, medical calculators, calculators out there that you just plug in the numbers, it'll spit out uh, the values for you. Now, the beauty of these non-invasive scores right there in your clinic, you can already predict if there's significant fibrosis or is there uh, no fibrosis at all. So very good clinical tools. Now, of course, there are other non-invasive ways of measuring fibrosis. You have the APRI score, which is just, just your AST or the platelet count. Um, you have your transient elastography, which is just your fiber scan. Uh, shear wave RFE is very similar to your fiber scan. You have fiber tests as well, which is based on blood tests. Now, FibroScan has an additional tool, which is what we call CAP or Control Attenuation Parameter. Um, now CAP can also um, put a number uh, on the amount of steatosis that the patient has. And in general, that would be more accurate than your ultrasound uh, estimation of uh, liver steatosis. Now, a common denominator with all these non-invasive tests is that they are very good uh, when you're looking at the extremes of the test. What do I mean? If the test tells you that there's no fibrosis or minimal fibrosis, then the, the accuracy is about 90%. If the test tells you that there's cirrhosis, then the accuracy is about 90% as well. So very good test if you fall into those extremes. Now, the problem is if the test tells you there's F2, F3, F1 fibrosis, now that's where the test, uh, the, the accuracy of the test falls to about 70%, okay? So, but it's still not 
all in vain. I mean, uh, if you can get an estimate of the fibrosis score, it will be an additional tool for you in order to convince your patient to do what they're supposed to do in order to uh, treat the disease. Okay, so uh, we're now moving on to treatment, but I think before we go to treatment, it's very important to really discuss a little bit about the pathophysiology. Now, this is the, the modern hypothesis with regards to how uh, MAFLD or NAFLD happens in an individual. So basically, you know, as you, if you look at this uh, figure, uh, this, um, you know, uh, graphical representation, it seems to be confusing, right? I mean, there's a lot of pathways, but basically, I, well, I won't uh, discuss each of the pathways, don't worry, um, but basically what it tells us is that for steatosis to happen in the liver, it involves a lot of pathways. I mean, there can be lipodystrophy, you can have uh, dysbiosis in your uh, microbiota, uh, in, your, in your intestinal um, segments. Uh, you can have problems in your inflammation, um, a lot of things. You can have genetic reasons as well. Um, the end result really is formation of fat in the liver. And once you have fat, the final uh, problem that can happen is, of course, there can be um, reactive oxygen species formation in the liver, and that will induce inflammation and succeeding uh, in uh, fibrosis, okay? Now, the reason why I showed you this graph is that I want to show you uh, that because, the, because we know about uh, all of these pathways, uh, there are multiple ways that we can target the disease, okay? So all of these drugs have been tried uh, for fatty liver disease. Um, uh, of course, you may, you may recognize some of them, pioglitazone, liraglutide, as well as vitamin E are things that are available to us already, okay? Now, among the new drugs that are being tried for fatty liver disease, obreticolic acid is the closest one uh, to being approved, although it's still not approved in the U.S., for fatty liver disease. If it's an, if it's, uh, it's an FXR agonist, basically um, it has been shown to decrease inflammation and, and fibrosis. Okay, I'll show you the results later on. Some of the other drugs, Sinicribarol, Selonsertid, and Afribinor. Um, unfortunately, uh, phase four trials, uh, phase three trials have come out um, in the recent one or two years, and um, they have been uh, negative trials. So unfortunately, I don't, I don't think we'll be seeing these three drugs in the market uh, soon. Now, of course, what is available to us are pilvitazone and liraglutide, which basically targets the insulin resistance pathway, and vitamin E, which targets your reactive oxygen species because it's an antioxidant. Now, of course, before we go to pharmacotherapy, uh, because we know that, you know, overweightedness or obesity is really one of the, um, you know, risk factors. In fact, it's a major uh, determinant of your MAFLD uh, diagnostic criteria. It, uh, it, just, um, it just makes sense uh, to advise your patients to lose weight, right? Now, this table uh, just tells you what happens to the liver when you achieve a certain amount of weight loss. And on the right side, you can see um, how hard it is actually to sustain that amount of weight loss over time. So if you see here, uh, if you have 3% weight loss, what happens? There's steatosis improvement in 30 to 100% of your patients, okay? Now, if it's 5% weight loss, what happens? There's already improvement in your inflammation. If it's 7%, what happens? NASH resolution, meaning the steatohepatitis, the, the, the inflammation that is in the liver totally resolves. And that is a very good result because that will also re result in a fibrosis regression later on. So that happens in the majority of your patients. If you have more than 10% weight loss, then there's fibrosis regression in about 
half of your patients. So all very good results, all very desirable results. However, you can see here on the right-hand portion, it's actually quite hard to, to sustain. And I'll show you some uh, real-world data in this slide. So this is just a cross-sectional study of my patients with natholm, and you can see here that even though I advise my patients each clinic visit that they have to lose weight, they have to exercise, look at the results. Only 40% of my patients actually uh, heed my advice of losing weight and about 30% um, even gain weight despite my advice to lose weight. And among those who lost weight, uh, most of them actually um, less than 5% weight loss. So, you know, it, it's, it's good enough, but not the five, at least 5% weight loss that we are looking for so that the inflammation will resolve in the liver. Now, I've also asked my fellow to look at, you know, the long-term follow-up of these patients and what is the probability of these patients, you know, um, maintaining the weight loss over time. So among the patients who had at least one year follow-up, is about 40% who had weight loss, about 40% who had weight gain. But among patients who had weight loss, look at the results. Over time, at seven years, only about 60% of these patients will maintain that weight loss. So most of them just revert back to what they've been doing uh, before, uh, maybe before knowing that they have fatty liver disease, and about 30% actually weight gain, had weight gain. Now, if you look at patients who gain weight, I would say these patients are probably the patients who are um, baseline hard-headed, okay? Because uh, you can see here that at seven years, 100% of them uh, still has weight gain. So very hard-headed. Uh, I'm, I'm sure the uh, endocrinologists um, know about this and um, pwede kong actually refer na lang sa endocrinologist uh, so that they'll have the headache of dealing with these patients. Um, okay, so what about the results of the pharmacotherapy for uh, fatty liver disease? You can see here, uh, pilvitazone and vitamin E, very good results in terms of steatosis improvement as well as liraglutide um, and also for obeticolic acid. Now, the problem with liraglutide is that uh, one is injectable, it's an injectable drug, and two, uh, the phase three uh, trial that they did, um, there, there was a lot of side effects uh, in terms of GI side effects, a lot of nausea, a lot of vomiting in the patients who were given liraglutide. So I don't know if uh, this will sit well with patients uh, if you're going to give them uh, for fatty liver. Now, what about uh, improvement of NASH? So again, for vitamin E and pivotizone and liraglutide, very good results in terms of resolution of NASH. Um, Alafribinor, as I've said, you know, um, phase three trials, negative results. So I, I won't even talk about them anymore. Uh, now the problem with, uh, this one is for fibrosis. You can see here for vitamin E, pioglitazone, and liraglutide, uh, numerical difference compared to uh, placebo, but no statistical difference. But I'm, uh, I submit to you that if you resolve the NASH, if you follow these patients over time, longer duration of time, these patients will have significant improvement in fibrosis as well. Now, beticolic acid decrease in, um, in fibrosis scores in, give, in patients were given uh, beticolic acid. However, the problem with beticolic acid, a lot of pruritus, Half of the patients who were given 25 milligram dose had pruritus, and 10% of these patients had to stop uh, medications because of pruritus. Another side effect uh, that may be significant in more patients is uh, the presence of cholecystitis and cholelithiasis in patients who were given obeticolic acid. And I think that is the reason why the FDA has been very reluctant uh, to approve obeticolic acid for fatty liver. Now, finally, I'll just show, show you the apostle guidelines on how to really deal with patients with MAFO. So if you have a patient with risk factors for fatty liver disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, or metabolic derangements, then you have to screen for uh, fatty liver. 
either through ultrasound um, or maybe serum biomarkers. As I've said, the fatty liver index is one of them uh, that you can do. Uh, if they have fatty liver, the next thing that you have to do is get the weight, get the BMI. If the patient is overweight or, or obese, then you clinch your diagnosis already of MAFO. If the patient's diabetes, then you also clinch your diagnosis of MAFO. The problem, of course, is that if you don't have diabetes, if you don't have overweightedness, then you still have to look for the presence of uh, metabolic risk. So you look at uh, waist circumference, your triglycerides levels, your high, uh, HDL levels as well, okay, in order to get diagnosis of MAFO. Now, once you have MAFO diagnosis, then as I mentioned, you have to assess the degree of fibrosis in the patient because that's a very important prognostic indicator for these patients with fatty liver. So you can either do your FIT4 score, MAFO fibrosis score, uh, send the patient out for fibro scan or fibro test. All of these things would be very helpful. Um, aside from, of course, your usual albumin, your usual prothrombin time, bilirubin levels, EST and platelet count for patients with uh, fatty liver disease. Now, if your fibrosis scores uh, says there's, there's no fibrosis or minimal fibrosis, it's low risk. So, but you still have to follow these patients up ideally every year, uh, every six months to one year uh, for your biochemical test and uh, repeat your fibrosis assessment every two to three years. Now, if you have intermediate to high risk, may, uh, meaning stage three, stage four fibrosis, um, if you so desire, then you can refer them to a specialist um, and to properly assess for uh, liver uh, cirrhosis. If you clinch the diagnosis of liver cirrhosis, then you have to have surveillance for HCC as well. Now, of course, if you have muffled, this is, this is how you approach the treatment of uh, fatty liver disease. Number one, of course, as I've mentioned, weight loss. You have to emphasize diet, exercise. Um, um, I would say patients with obesity, sometimes it's very hard to exercise. Um, then resistance exercise is good enough. So you can ask a patient to just use dumbbells. You know, anything that will make them sweat uh, will be good enough, uh, better than nothing. Um, and um, primarily for dieting is really cut down on carbs uh, because that's the most important, I would say, most the, the fastest way to gain weight as well as the fastest way to lose weight is to cut down on your carbs. Um, and then, of course, we know that for fatty liver disease, there's concomitant metabolic risk. Then you have to treat these metabolic uh, risk factors. If you have hypertension, treat it. If you have dyslipidemia, don't worry about statins. You can treat the patients with statins because most uh, studies uh, using statins for NAFO uh, patients have been uh, good studies. Um, ALT usually goes on as well if you give statins. Uh, treat the diabetes if the patient's diabetes as well. Other approaches, uh, metformin and simvastatin has been shown to decrease your HCC risk as well. So if there's indication to treat uh, patients with metformin or simvastatin, go ahead, give these two drugs for patients with fatty liver. And of course, we have liver-directed treatment. As I mentioned, vitamin E and theobitazone has been shown uh, to decrease your inflammation and also resolve your NASH in the liver. And uh, these are very good drugs that you can try uh, for patients with fatty liver. Liraglutide, maybe more data is needed in order, uh, before you can um, advise them uh, universally for patients with NAFO. So finally, I would say that, uh, that the adaptation of the criteria for MAFO uh, is going to be universal soon. Um, but if you don't meet the criteria for MAFO initially, you still need to follow these patients up uh, because these patients may eventually uh, meet your criteria for MAFO. In fact, some patients who do not meet criteria for MAFO initially may actually have fibrosis already at the outset. So you really have to uh, get your non-invasive scores as well. 
both simple steatosis and uh, steatohepatitis hepatitis can progress to liver cirrhosis. So you have to follow these patients up and HCC as well. Um, fibrosis is the most important prognostic factor. That is why it's imperative that you have to check for fibrosis in your clinic. Diet and exercise are the cornerstones of treatment. But however, I've shown you also that it's very difficult to obtain and I think even harder to sustain in patients because I think patients are naturally hard-headed or maybe naturally matakaw. It's, it's very hard to um, resist good food, I would say. Um, and of course, if you have underlying risk factors, then you treat the underlying metabolic risk factors. And among the pharmacotherapy out there, pioglitazone and vitamin E are the two most proven drugs uh, for fatty liver disease. And with that, uh, I will end my talk uh, and thank you for your attention. You may now proceed to our Sunset Symposium. Please go to www.tiktok2021.com and click on the room you would like to join.